So I want to pray as well, because with the body of Christ together right now, we need to be praying into situations in the world, particularly Israel. Remember what I always say, don't interpret it through the BBC journalists or your own biases or what somebody said about them. It's irrelevant. Not interested in what your thoughts are. It's what the Bible says. And what you're seeing in the Middle East right now, you might say, oh, Israel's killing so many people. Well, we've prayed consistently that God in Zechariah said, I will remove the king of Gaza. Guess what's happened? The king has been removed. And uproot all that of the Hamas weed that's left. Guess what? That has been massive uprooting. Now I've seen the same in Hezbollah. The king of Hezbollah has been removed and we're consistently uprooting that. Why is that? Well, that is because Lebanon and Iran and Gaza and Egypt all have wonderful prophecies and plans in the word that God wants to see happen. So if we can do all the uprooting, which is happening, then the gospel can go into Gaza, into Lebanon, because we're behind the Lebanese people, we're behind the people in Gaza and Egypt. We want to see the yoke removed from them. So Father, thank you for the state of Israel, that that nation was reborn again in accordance to your word in a mighty miracle. And you have watched over Israel, and you say, he who watches over Israel, I don't slumber and I do not sleep. And I thank you that you have removed the king of Gaza, you have removed the king of Hezbollah, and we are seeing the uprooting. So we just declare the continuation of that uprooting. So these nations of Lebanon, you said in the word that Lebanon will skip like a calf, that she will be revived by your word and there'll be a mighty outpouring. So we speak over the Lebanese people right now that they'll be drawn to you, our brothers and sisters in Lebanon today, that they would be empowered and rejuvenated and encouraged in your word. That the people in Gaza, that the gospel would finally be able to enter the Gaza Strip. That those people who have been so suppressed will find light and life in you, Jesus. We thank you that you've given Israel the ability to cut off the supply line of Iran. So we speak that in the spiritual realm. We just bind that death cult spirit in Jesus' name that tries to destroy the Jewish people. We know why that is, Lord, because the enemy tries to prevent you coming back and ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. But we declare peace to you, Jerusalem, and we speak peace of the borders of Israel. We speak your blood to protect that nation. We speak courage and empowerment to Benjamin Netanyahu and his Knesset government members. And we thank you that your purposes and plans will take place, that Jerusalem will become a joy to all nations. And thank you that we have a part to play in that, Jesus. And we just declare that in your mighty name. Amen. 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 So it's good to, to pray for Israel. That's very powerful um, that you're praying for Israel. Because Israel is very much on God's heart all of the time. So I said it at the Hope Church a while ago. Israel, I used to think years ago when I first became a believer, is a subject you can opt out of or opt in. It's just a, an added extra. No, it's part of being a believer. You need a revelation from the Holy Spirit of Israel and the Jewish people, for sure. So, that's not what I was going to talk about. What I was going to talk about today is something from the Older Covenant um, that I'm going to reveal. Because guess what? All of Scripture is given to us, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To edify us, build us up, mm -hmm. etc. And Jesus is hidden in the Older Covenant as well. Sometimes it's not that obvious. <laughs> So we want to reveal the newer covenant in that. So my title is going to be Jesus, our mercy seat. You may not have heard of that phrase before, but we're going to look at that, our mercy seat. So I'm going to look at, in a minute, 1 Samuel. And I'm going to look at a group of people who lived in a town called Beth Shemesh. And Beth Shemesh was a part of Israel that was given, because you've got to remember when Israel conquered the land and subdued their enemies it was divided up a portion for Judah a portion for the Levites a portion for Dan and Beth Shemesh was a 
Levites. It was given to the Levites. The Levites were the ones who ministered to the Lord. They were the ones who dealt with the Ark of the Covenant. They had special uh, roles to play. So Beth Shemesh was a, uh, a point of a Levite city. And the reason I'm going to talk about it is to do with the Ark of the Covenant, which you may have heard of. The Ark of the Covenant was basically a wooden box. But it was overlaid with gold, and it had two cherubim angels that sat on the top of it. But the key part of the Ark of the Covenant was the presence of the Lord that dwelt between the cherubim. So in the older covenant, that was where God's presence on earth was. And the journey of the Ark of the Covenant, the children of Israel came into the Promised Land, and they set up a temporary tabernacle in a place called Shiloh. You may have heard of that. And at Shiloh was, when you've often heard this familiar passage, when there was a young Samuel and Eli, do you remember that bit where Eli said to him, oh, if you hear the voice calling you again, he's probably God. This was in Shiloh. So it was like a tabernacle, a temporary arrangement, but it was there for hundreds of years before there was a temple. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. So, so let's just have a look at this story to begin with, just so I can frame what I'm going to talk about. Because I said, there are many new covenant truths in the older covenant. So we just want to have a look at that. So I'm going to start off then by looking at 1 Samuel chapter 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4. So the Ark of the Covenant, there has been in Shiloh for all of these years. And here is Israel now, one of their enemies that was never subdued, the Philistines. Mm -hmm. They battled against Israel consistently. They were always a thorn in Israel's side. Israel never fully did what God told them to do and get rid, so they <coughs> remained there. So in 1 Samuel chapter 4, I'm going to start at the, at the first verse. And it says, Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and encamped beside Ebenezer. You may have heard of Ebenezer. As Samuel took a stone, didn't he, and said, I'm going to call it Ebenezer. Thus far has the Lord helped us. So Ebenezer. And the Philistines encamped in Apek. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. And when the people had come in the camp, the elders of Israel said, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? What is going on here? So the journey of the Ark of the Covenant took its next step. It left Shiloh, and they sent for it to the battle. So it says in the next bit, let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us. Because remember, what was the Ark of the Covenant? God's presence. That when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. So along comes the Ark, and there it is. So Israel is very confident now got the Ark of the Covenant, we're going to win this battle against the Philistines. But if we carry on to the next verse and go into verse, let's go to verse 6. Now when the Philistines heard the noise of this, oh, let's just go back a minute to verse 5. So the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord comes into the camp and all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. Have you ever known that before? Have you ever shouted that loud that the earth has shook? That's powerful. They didn't do it because they thought half-hearted shouting going on here, was it? They knew the presence of the Lord would come in. We can do this thing now. Wow. So guess what happens here? When they shout so loud, the enemy hears that. So look what the, the Philistines said. Now when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what does the sound of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood. The ark of the Lord has come into the camp. So the Philistines were afraid. 
And the enemy gets afraid when we start invoking the name of Jesus and starts powerfully reminding God of his word. That's powerful. So the Philistines were afraid and they said, God has come into the camp. You know, the enemy is aware. The Philistines were not that stupid. They knew they did not want to fight God. And they said, woe to us for such a thing has never happened before. Woe to us. Who will deliver us from these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians. So they knew about that with the plagues in the wilderness. However, be strong and conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you don't become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. So there was a battle that ensued. And it says the Philistines fought. Israel was defeated. And I think that says a lot about what was going on in Israel at the time that God allowed that to happen. So Israel was defeated. Every man fled to his tent. There was a big slaughter and there fell 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. So this is a big tragedy in the history of Israel. The ark, the presence of God on earth, has been captured by the Philistines. What is going on here? And then you might remember the next bit in 1 Samuel 5. The Philistines took the ark of the covenant and they put it in the temple in Ashdod. So they're in the city of Ashdod. And they took it into the temple of their god, Dagon. You might remember that. So I'm not going to read all of that. But basically the ark of the covenant is placed in there. And every morning when they came in, Part of the, the God, the image of Dagon, it's either its head had dropped off, its arm had come away, because it was in the presence of God. Nothing can stand mm -hmm. in that. And not only that, but plagues and tumours started to break out amongst the Philistine people, and they knew something is seriously going wrong here. So they sent the, the Ark of the Covenant to Garth in the Philistines, um, area but that was the same they knew something was wrong the plague was still wreaking havoc and then it was moved on to Ekron so let's join that in 1 Samuel 5 just so I can explain this bit to you 1 Samuel 5 and I'm going to look at verse 10 so let's see what they said verse 10 so they sent the ark of God to Ekron so it was, as the ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, saying, They brought the ark of the God of Israel to us, to kill us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines. So they need a plan to get rid, basically, because God was causing, and they could see what was happening, because it was manifested, and death was, was there. So basically what happened next is, the Philistine lords decided to put a cart together of new wood, put the ark on this new cart, get two cows that have just calved, harness them up, and send them off. And depending which way they go, the Philistines would know if this was the hand of God or not. And when the calves, when the cows were just let loose, they did not go back wandering for their calves, they went straight down the road to Beth Shemesh, back to Israel, which was like, wow, that was definitely the hand of God. So the Philistines knew straight away that it was God. They went dumb back to them. So let's go to 1 Samuel 6 now, and this is the bit where I'm going to home in on. 1 Samuel 6, verse 13. And the ark is now going to come back to Beth Shemesh, you know, the city of the Levites. So it says this. The people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark. Now this ark has been gone seven, eight, nine months, that sort of order. So quite a long time. And maybe they thought they'd never see it again, and they were bereft of God's help and presence. But they lifted their eyes and saw the ark. And they rejoiced to see it. I bet they did. Wow, because they knew that God was back with them. 
So it says that the cart came back into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stood there. A large stone was there. So basically, the Levites took it off the cart, put it on this big stone area. But it's the next bit that's the problem. So let's just show you in verse 19 of that same chapter. And it says, He struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark. Of the Lord. He struck 50,070 men of the people, and the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. Now you might say, What's going on here? What's that all about? They look into the ark, there's a great slaughter. Well, the men of Beth Shemesh, to look into the ark, there's something they had to do. I don't know if you can picture the ark. In your mind's eye, I used to have a model of it, but I haven't, I haven't got it anymore. But anyway, to look inside the ark, you had to remove the mercy seat. That was on the top, basically, of the book. The two cherubim and the mercy seat. And then you could look into the side of the ark. That was the next bit. Now, when you looked inside the ark, and it explains this to us in the New Covenant as well, what would they have seen? Well, apart from the offerings that the Philistines made and sent back, they would have found the two tablets of stone. What were they? We know them as the Ten Commandments. They would have found a golden pot of manna. Remember when God fed the the children of Israel on manna? And they would have found Aaron's rod that budded. Okay? So these were symbols of what? Well, number one, they were symbols of man's disobedience against God's righteous standards so God wrote the Ten Commandments they were symbols of rejection of God's anointed leader the rod that budded and they were also um, rejection or of the complaining about when they were fed on the manna because God was always he said I would always take care of you after Egypt but they were always complaining and, and moaning, etc. So rejection of his provision and rebellion against the leadership. So there were symbols of man's sin, yeah, and rebellion. That's that's what they were. But the key thing here is the mercy seat. So the mercy seat would go over those symbols. So guess what? You would never see them. And the mercy seat was covered with what? When the priest presided, blood. It was covered with blood. And blood is the thing that brings what? Forgiveness. And in the older covenants, it didn't bring true forgiveness. It covered over, didn't it? It covered temporarily. But it was still there. So God saw the blood. He did not see the rebellion. So when the men of Beth Shemesh, whoa, the ark's back. Let's pull this back and have a peep inside. Whoa, a great slaughter is ensued because when they looked inside it they saw a ministry of death written on stone tablets that was a ministry of death it was not a ministry of life for the law they saw that the letter kills and it was a ministry of condemnation so we can look at that in 2 Corinthians Chapter 3. So let's bring it up to the New Covenant now and start to explain how Jesus is hidden so we can reveal it. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I'm going to start around verse 6. So, but our sufficiency is, is, of, is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter does what kills but the spirit gives life but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones there you go was glorious so that the children of israel could not look steadily at the face of moses because of the glory of his countenance which glory was passing away How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? 
For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. So this is the new covenant. We've got rid of the law and the ministry of death that has gone because there's now a new covenant. Amen? That's powerful. So that's why death broke out when they looked. And here's the, here's the reality. It was a Levitical city. It belonged to the Levites. They should have known. Why were they letting people remove the mercy seat? They knew death would end you if they did that. But they still did what they did. So death could have been prevented in Beth Shemesh when the Ark of the Covenant came back. But you know what? I think there's quite a lot of relevance here for us with the mercy seat as well. Because a lot of us, or maybe, dare I say, even some church leaders, not here, that's for sure, but sometimes we're using that same thinking where we're using the law to point out all the ways in which you've done wrong okay, and making you feel bad. So that condemnation from that will hopefully make you lead a better, more respectable life. But guess what? It does not work like that. It does not work if you try and say, hey, here's all the bad things you've done right, shape up a little bit and live better. Guess what? It's not going to work, is it? People tend to just get worse if you just point out all the bad in them. And that always reminds me of the woman who was so-called caught in the act of adultery, if you remember, and they brought her to Jesus, didn't they? Hoping he would allow them to stone her. And he, one by one they all went, didn't they, when he asked them about the first one without sin can cast the stone. And I love that bit where he says... Where are your accusers? Is there no one left to condemn you? No, there's nobody. Then neither do I. Neither do I. So it was not the spirit of condemnation or death, but forgiveness. And through that, the woman was then empowered, wasn't she? To go away and be, wow, I've just had an encounter with Jesus. That's transformed my life. So that is, is the key there. So... We're not against the law, by the way, for the reasons the law was given. There was a reason it was given. (coughs) But it was not given to make us righteous, was it? We know that. It was not given that man could be justified through obeying the rules. It could never be. Because guess what? We could never keep them, could we? Couldn't even keep one of them. Never mind all 300 or whatever there was. So it was given to expose our sin and our rebellion and to bring us to the end of ourselves where we go, how can I do this without a saviour? There's no chance I can get through life or I could ever be good enough. And the default position for most people, maybe you watching this might be right now, come off it, I'm good enough, I've done, I've done enough, I'm sure God will let me in. No, because you're a lawbreaker, we've all broken it. In one little thing, we've broken the lot. So we cannot get into heaven but what we can have is the past to get in now before we even get there the paid blood of Jesus amen so that brings us on to the whole concept of righteousness doesn't it so the whole thing of righteousness so we can never earn as I just said our righteousness by keeping the law it's impossible or somebody did keep all the law perfectly for us and paid the price for us Jesus without him we don't have a chance so righteousness then is not something you earn but it's a gift you receive yeah and I think this is one of the key stumbling blocks when I sometimes listen to new believers or I sometimes go in other churches righteousness they think comes from you out of you or it does not. You receive it. You ask Jesus into your heart. You get the gift of righteousness. That's what changes you. So let's look at that. Let's go to the book of Romans. And just explore this thing in Romans chapter 5. And verse 17. And this will just confirm to us. And it says. For if by the one man's offence. That was Adam. 
death reign through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Mm. They're a gift. You receive it, you don't earn it, you don't try and do it. So, that means that when, when your focus is, on, focus is on Jesus and you're following him and, and he's in your heart, you've already fulfilled the law because he's already done it and he's in you, so you have fulfilled the law. And it makes it completely different because if you think about the law, the law would say, do not steal. But when you have the love of God in your heart, not only do you not want to steal, but it makes you more generous. Yes. So it goes over and above what the law said. The law was impossible. How could I ever achieve not stealing? Somebody might say. But now God has changed that heart of stone and given you a new one, that a heart of flesh. So you go, I don't need to steal because Jesus has provided everything for me. In fact, I want to bless these people over here. That's the difference with the righteousness that we now receive. It motivates us because of the love of Christ within us to do the things, but we don't do them to earn the righteousness. So the mercy seat. Now, the thing with the mercy seat, I think is quite interesting as well as we can, we can inadvertently remove the mercy seat in our own lives. Now, we're in a new covenant, I understand that, but I'm just using this as an analogy. But you can easily, in yourself, go back and dwell on the things you did wrong as a non-believer or even as a believer and go, oh, if only the people in one church knew what's been going on. Or maybe you've had thoughts or, or whatever it could be that's drawn you back to reviewing the stuff in the Ark of the Covenant and, and re-looking at the, the tablets of stone and the, the manna bowl and the, and the rod that budded, but you've done it in your own life and they oh, woe is me, I've done so much wrong. Why have you done that? You've removed the mercy seat and you've become like the men of Beth Shemesh who pushed the mercy seat away to peer into the box and unleashed that ministry of death. Now, it's different for us because we're in a covenant of grace. You're not going to be struck down a lot of people are going to be struck down by God. You're not. Jesus has always already struck down for us. Hallelujah. So you don't have, therefore have to be weighed down by guilt or sin of the past. Because the mercy seat of Jesus' blood is over your life. So when Jesus sees you, when God sees you, he sees the blood of his son <coughs> covered. He is your mercy seat. So we don't need to go rooting around in our Ark of the Covenant for all the old stuff in our you know people say what skeletons have you got in the cupboard don't they yeah. and stuff like that well we haven't got any because the mercy seat has covered her we don't need to drag it out so we don't need to look at the old ways so God doesn't look at you with your failures and your mistakes he looks at you through his son's blood and how you are being transformed into the image of him day by day so that's awesome isn't it so we have full value in him so just to finish off with the key scripture here as well thinking of righteousness and how the new covenant has changed everything you know we can fail we can feel defeated but the bottom line is we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus so let's just show you where that scripture is, because you may have heard it before. I'm not sure where it is. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. Let's go to verse 21 at the end. And it says, For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ Jesus. Amen. So don't let us be like the men on Beth Shemesh. We don't need to go removing our mercy seat. We don't have to review how bad we are. We don't have to review all the bad thoughts we had or the mistakes we've made. Just look at Jesus. Just remember you're covered by his mercy seat and his blood perpetually. Are you not? Past, present, future, 
forgiven. So thank you, Lord, for your word to us today. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that it's so amazing, I always think, that how you are there in the older covenant, sometimes hidden, sometimes we've got to just peel the layers back a little bit. But we thank you for that revelation that as the men of Beth Shemesh rooted around and revealed a ministry of death, we thank you that your blood overcame all of that and took all the death and took all of the sin and dealt with it once and for all. And we thank you, Jesus, that you are our mercy seat on which your blood was sprinkled upon. And that covers our lives. It protects us. It delivers us. It sustains us. It prospers us. It brings us before kings and princes. It favours us in so many ways. So we just want to speak that out today, Jesus, and remind ourselves who we are in you, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. amen.